when I practiced as a monastic, we used to chant. And, you know, in some cultures you do yoga, in some cultures you do um, other things to kind of transition from whatever day you had um, to being in silence. And so if you're physically able, I'm just gonna ask you to take one of your shoulders and just imagine a string lifting it up. So as you breathe in, lift up one shoulder. And if this is hard, find something that you can do with your body. Now breathe out and just bring it back down. Other shoulder, breathe in, go up. And breathe out, come down. One more time on the other shoulder on your own time. Just breathe in, up. Hold it as long as it feels comfortable and then just breathe out. Bring it down, go to the shoulder. This is available to you. Put your fingertips on your shoulders and take your elbows to the front, all the way up as far as can be possible. And then all the way back as far as possible and then to the earth. Two more times, breathe in. One more time. And now three times the other direction. All the way back, all the way up as far as you can, all the way front and to the earth. So the back of you, the sky, front. Finish up on your time. And uh, I've worked as a high school teacher and I tell my students, just shake anything you don't need right now in your life. Just shake, 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 shake. Just, you know, just invite it to go out with your hands. Just move the energy out. And you know, these little resets, can be good. If you're having a frustrating day at work, go to the bathroom and then just shake a little bit, do some tapping, some roller show. Um, it's a kindness to the body. Um, I think the title meditation teacher is kind of a funny title. Yeah, it's very easy to say, okay, shut up, pay attention to your breath. <laughs> um, but it's more of encouraging just the moment right now if you have been practicing with a meditation object, uh, you can mute me now and go ahead and then join us um, around seven o'clock. And then just enjoy your practice if it's metta or body scanning, whatever you're doing. And it's lovely to have you here in community. When you show up, you are encouraging everybody else. If you want to stay here for a little bit of a meditation, instruction, or encouragement, and don't mute me. Listen up. So just doing a small check-in with the body, mini body scan. Take your attention to your feet. Of course, this practice can be done in a whole hour, starting with your toes all the way to the forehead. But just right now, acknowledging your feet, if you have feet, and your ankles, and kind of like how is the state of your legs at the moment, your sitting bones. It's just a quick acknowledging of our bodies. That was the tummy, the stomach area, and the chest. Allowing the chest area to be the meditation object for a few seconds. There's nothing to accomplish, nothing to gain.
Just noticing if you're breathing fast or slow in between. How's your back, your lower back? It's the upper back. The shoulders. The arms. And the hands. Now let's switch our attention to the sounds. Like I can hear the neighbor's chihuahua and this clock. And I don't know if you can hear those things. But let's do a check-in of the sounds that are near you. And just judge me. My teacher's teacher used to say, do not disturb the noise. <laughs> because we think that noise disturbs us. So Ajahn Chah was just very practical. He used to say, you don't need complete silence. Now see if you can move your attention to sounds that perhaps are a little bit further. I have done 30 minute meditations of simply using sound as my meditation object. Where I'm resting on the sounds of the world, whether the sounds are pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, or both. We're not here to be meditation experts. If we show up in humility and experience the present moment as it is. So in this time of silence, pick something that will be simple, whether it's loving kindness or your breath. And if you want to give an, uh, a try, just listen.
Is this moment pleasant? Does the body feel pleasant? Does the mind feel pleasant? Is it unpleasant? Is the experience of the present moment both? Some bits are pleasant, some bits are not. Is it pretty neutral? And just for this second, let's invite just a non-judgmental, just invite a feeling of curiosity. Is there any judgment about your sits? And if so, let's soften that so that we can just be curious. Take a nice deep breath in and a deep breath out. I don't have a bell with me, so ding, ding. <laughs> and uh, let's take a couple of minutes for a stretch break. Drink some water and uh, maybe some dharma sharing. So let's be back in a couple of minutes. Invite everyone to come in at a time. So yeah, I'm in El Salvador. My father lives here and my mother lives in St. Paul. Got divorced when I was a baby, really. Didn't work out for them. But it works out for me because I get to travel and visit people in different places. Um, I will be going to Minnesota, I think, the 30th of this month. And um, I will be teaching a retreat September 22nd at the um, Prairie Farm place, which I have never been to. And uh, so that's quite exciting. Uh, so it's lovely to still have a connection to Minnesota. I went to college there, so I have a lot of friends. For this evening, you know, the, the tradition that I come is that uh, the Thai forest tradition and Dharma talks in the tradition are just kind of flowy and jazzy and, you know, you know tend to plan things. Um, what, I, what I've been thinking is about spiritual technologies. So the way I think of technology is that you have something that facilitates a goal. So into the Anthropology Museum today, and I was looking at all these grinding stones, you know, these stone things where you, they would grind maize and make flour out of corn. So you have this technology of stone we're using for thousands of years. And then we have high tech with our phones. So I do this and then I get something. You're thinking, what are, you know, what are the spiritual technologies that I use? what are my interpretations of the spiritual technologies of the traditions that I am familiar with and I have served me well. So mystic Catholicism, devotional Hinduism, and Theravada Buddhism. You know, what are the things that help me? What are the things that work? And for example, you know, for, for a long time, I really have loved this tripod in Buddhism where you have sila, samadhi, and panya, and how important it is to have integrity in what you say and what you do and all this stuff, right? And then you have meditation, but you also have the wisdom part where you also use your brain. And uh, the devotional aspect is something that gets us out of ourselves and I was in Thailand for 18 months and just seeing, I remember these older ladies would come in and during the full moon and the new moon, we would meditate all night and they would just chant and they were so devotional. And then I would watch them and they would just sit. <laughs> and then four hours later, they would ring the bell and they would gossip and drink some tea and they would just sit. And they were just these solid ladies who had never been to college, who were not very sophisticated the way, you know, cosmopolitan cities are. And I was 24, I had just finished my bachelor's. I was applying for a master's when I was there. I decided to live as a monastic. And I thought, okay, I'm not getting a master's degree. 
but I'm going to get a master's degree in enlightenment. You know, Buddhism has all these lists. So there's a, you know, there's four stages of enlightenment. And then there's all these things like the Noble Eightfold Path. And, and then I'll just get rid of these fetters. I had never heard the word fetter before I had been to Thailand. But, you know, there's these things I had to get rid of and all these virtues I had to bring in. And once I do that, I'll get my enlightenment diploma. You know, I always say this, how um, some of it was quite unconscious, but the other one is having lived in the US since a teenager, um, I had, it had become ingrained how accomplishing things is quite celebrated in the US. Right? So if you accomplish five things, it's good, but if you accomplish 25 things, that's a lot better. And now that I'm 52, I, you know, I don't want to accomplish enlightenment like that, you know, that there is this being that in the future is somehow going to be awake is no longer a narrative that serves me. And spirituality can get so complicated, you know, uh, there were lots of universities in India. You can definitely get Buddhist studies degrees in the United States now and Dharma teacher training and so you can have spiritual credentials and then what? You know, like I just really love this thing in Buddhism where you look at suffering, the most mundane, non-special, everybody has it. Now, having lived in California, you know, in San Francisco, um, and it happens all over the States, but sometimes people get very involved in making their suffering very, very special. And uh, that doesn't happen in other cultures, you know, where you're like, let me tell you. And then with the uh, American thing of like, I pulled myself by my bootstraps. I noticed people will have like three or four stories to say how bad their life is and how good they are. You know, there, there are these patterns that I, that I would see and as a spiritual technology, you know, chanting, for example, um, I stayed with some Benedictine monks, uh, monks in England. And later on, I found out that all these researchers were doing um, studies on the physiology, and, you know, what happens when people chant. And I've also been thinking about how people talk about the East and the West. And I have identified really well why that really annoys me because the Buddha didn't invent enlightenment, you know? And where does the West begin and where does the East? And you know, I'm moving to Australia. So is that East or West? You know, people are talking about what European based cultures and what are those technologies used in the East and in the West? You know, what, how are people doing that? And is the feeling that everybody in sub-Saharan Africa has never been enlightened. That the ancestors in Latin America, there's never been an enlightened person. They've never, they've never known the present moment because enlightenment comes from the East. You know, there is a presentation where there is this thing called enlightenment or spiritual practice or spiritual sophistication. And, you know, because I've been thinking about this, like, I, I'm thinking, like, why was there so many human and animal sacrifice in the past? Were they just stupid? Like, I don't know. You know, like, you look at the Old Testament, or, or you look at here, you know, the, the Mayans and the Aztecs, and they're like, they would sacrifice these animals. Like, I don't know what that spiritual technology is about. I saw in, in, in Nepal, an ox being sacrificed. And I remember in India seeing camels that were heading to be sacrificed. So it's still happening. You know? What is the technology of lighting candles? You know, why do we do these things? So I think for this talk, what I want you to take away is what technologies are you using and to what purpose is there one? You know, what, what's making you curious because Recently, I've been <laughs> focusing on one word things, 
really, really, what does it mean to be generous for me? And with my people of color group in San Francisco, we, ha we had a whole section on the word kindness. So you can put that on the sticker. The Dalai Lama says, oh, kindness is my religion. But really, what, what does that mean for me? You know, there's so much of this <sighs> Buddhism meeting materialism and capitalism. And that's, you know, that's what happens, right? That like Buddhism goes to China and it has this flavor. And then Buddhism goes to Sri Lanka and it has this flavor. So now Buddhism comes to the United States and it has a beautiful mixing with psychotherapy, for example, with scientific research, with the brain research. But it also meets capitalism and it also meets racism and it also meets all of these things. Sexism, you know, all of those things also, you know, there's a blending. So then when people present whatever religion, then it becomes dogma. And you know, the word religion, some people are like, oh, I, I like spirituality, but not religion. And the Latin religare, liga is just, just a strap. So to restrap yourself, you know, to, to reconnect, to have union, to have yoga, that's what religion was about, right? And, you know, if you go to the Mall of America and you ask all of these people, hey, how many times did you meditate this week? You know, so all of us are a little bit of an exception in this little Zoom, you know, that you're spending your Wednesday evening saying, oh, I want to cultivate my mind. I want to meditate. That is very rare. And it's actually very generous because you're, you know, helping other people. And so this investigation is what really we passionize about. And I, and I love the word curiosity and seeing how, you know, when I got to Thailand, I had never been to a meditation class. I had never been to a meditation retreat. I just showed up because Christian monasteries didn't accept me. And I just, you know, I'm like, I'm going to be here for six months, ended up being six, seven years of my life, most of my 20s. And seeing the technology of a monastic where I could only wear these brown, ugly robes. We don't have like the Zen, you know, like these gorgeous robes. And I was like, oh, I want those <laughs> embroidered, nice silk things and the little brooches. You just got these ugly robes. And that's when I started shaving my head and no sexuality of any kind, right? So no masturbation, no flirting, no dating no nothing, no handling of money. I'm like, well, okay, so that's a technology of renunciant. And you can go through the motions and then what? See? And so I'm just really curious now of how we do what we do and, and to start really questioning, are there goals that I think I'm gonna get? And the more I kind of soften into all of that, the spiritual technologies become quite beautiful. So to really say, what does it mean to be patient? To stand that which is difficult to withstand. So you have dukkha, you know, and then the second noble truth is that you want the present moment to be something that is not. Desire is fine, but it's the attaching of, I don't want to be in debt. I want a better lover. I want a better boss. So you have a list. And then the third one is the gospel, right? It's, it's presented as Ayurvedic medicine. There's a disease, there's the cause of the disease, and then there's the prognosis, and then there's the treatment. So the noble Eiffel path has this thing of like, okay, have your, have your right view, don't think these kind of weird things like if you do these rituals, then you will get enlightened. You know, there's this section of the Noble Eightfold Path, the first part where it's, what are your intentions? What are your thoughts? You know, using the head. And then you have the body comes in and it's like, are you lying? Are you gossiping? 
do you have do you make your money by selling slaves or doing really horrible things and then you have the other one where you have mindfulness and meditation and meditation the jhanas is allowing the mind to do what it does which is to be calm and we live in a society which is designed not to be calm and all of these things are in my experience in the three religions that i have used in my technologies they're all present saint teresa of avila is a hero of mind and last month i went to avila to spain and i sat where she sat and i looked at her clothes and i was just really moved and she could meditate in the same ways that hindus and buddhists do and in the same stages right? even though she was a catholic nun the hindus do it and so generosity morality this was not invented by the buddha he was a very important person and remember they say a small religious group that has an army can become a religion so the mormons are in a country that is rich so there's a lot of mormons and then king ashoka in india spread out buddhism and what is this buddhism you know what is it in, in my life and uh, so i want to open it up to see if uh, what i'm saying is making sense if anybody has a question or a comment on um, do we you know are we clear or do are we curious about um, what it is that we do and how uh, how to best use these tools that have been passed by cultures by families by religions by scriptures um, how do we use them we have about 10 eight minutes left so i just wanted to open it up and please feel free to disagree with me or you know um, so i want to open it up to see if anyone has any questions and um, thanks for listening to my chance to talk so feel free to unmute yourself i i have a, a question nils i before i ask it i just I just feel, boy, this was great timing because I've been just thinking, what is Buddhism and what am I really signing up for here? <laughs> and why am I going through this? And um, but anyway, my question was using the word technologies. And what do you mean by that? Because when you say that, I immediately think of my computer and iPhone and I can't get past it. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I don't know where I read it. And, I, and you know, like I was saying at the museum where I see a tool. So you have the, the technologies to be able to do that. So let's let's talk about tools. And um, so technology to me is a whole bunch of tools and how to use them. And as far as, you know, I wanted to share with you when I think of Buddhism, I also think of the word taking refuge these tropical storms that we've been having, you know, there's this thing like, ah, rain, rain, rain. And then you go and then you're under a roof and it's like, oh. <laughs> it feels so nice, right? I think of that as one of those snowstorms and then you're inside in the heat. And there's that, that's something where you're taking refuge in something that really helps you as opposed to taking refuge in, um, oh, I want to look pretty forever and ever, or I want to take refuge in, in my career, because you know, as an art right. teacher, if I lose my sight, then what happens, right? So, yeah. Hmm. Any other comments? And it's okay if there's no other comments, it's fine too. But we have a couple of minutes. Um, I'm Jillian. Hi, Nils. It's great to have you. The first time I saw, if I can just note, you made such a great impression the first time I saw you. You said something like, 
oh, what a minor miracle that we're all here together. So I'll just echo those words back to you because they were just so such a beautiful impression. Um, um, I I think about um, um, these technologies that that you mentioned a lot as a parent because the way I show up as a parent um, is really different than how I was parented mm. and how previous generations were parented. And so it does, it takes a lot of mindfulness to understand that patterned responses are showing up that aren't personal. And then I, then to have the intentionality to behave in a way that isn't habitual in response to my, my daughter's whatever is happening in the moment. And so I really have so much gratitude for um, our community and, and the teachers that I've come across and, and the, the friendships that I've made um, because it shows up in these moments as a parent when so much habit energy is coming from generations, but also culture, like you mentioned, like distraction and, and reactivity and, you know, um, yeah. materialism, all of those things. So I, I notice I'm really grateful in that part of my life. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I just realized that we're going until it's 723 here. And I'm like, do we finish at 830? We're finished until nine. So I'm like, oh yeah, why am I feeling so rushed? So um, I'm happy that we have more, more time. And um, I'm so glad that you mentioned parenthood because you know, if you if you look at karma uh, with parenting, right? There's this very intertwined karma that happens. And um, you know, I look at my students who are teenagers and they have never seen the world without computers. And we're running this experiment with a human brain. And I'm not fully, you know, like horribly concerned, but the level of anxiety and self-harm that we're seeing is interesting. And having lived in San Francisco, I heard that these high tech executives are telling the nannies to not give technology to the kids. And when I thought of that, I'm like, oh my God, that reminds me of when doctors used to give cigarettes to people to you know, be well. And then having the, the information that when, you know, they, when they knew that cigarettes were not good, they kept that quiet. And I'm like, is there something going on? So uh, I'm, encountering a lot of parents who have kids with serious, serious mental health issues. And it's my impression as well that these young people are absorbing like sponges what our planet is going through. And as we live in a planet of well, you know what, I don't have to tell you what's going on, I don't think. But how are we going to live in a world with, with friction and um, I also think that in the United States and places in Europe, Buddhism has been presented as the self-soothing technique and meditation is this um, thing that one has to do, like exercise and eating well and flossing. And I talked to someone last week here in El Salvador, and he's like, I have done this kind of meditation and I've, you know, and I've got this meditation. And I'm like, so do you still do it? I'm like, no. <laughs> like, why are you boasting about something that you got training in, but you're not doing it? Uh, you know, it was kind of confusing for me. But then um, at this graduation party I was there two years uh, two days ago lots of family events this guy told me uh, a history of forgiveness and how 
basically, you know, he's a lawyer. He lost everything that this guy has stolen. And he went with a gun to kill him. And he couldn't do it. And then forgiveness happened. And then his life began to flourish. And it's also my impression that many people who meditate or who are curious, many times they have something as well that has happened to them. Like maybe they experienced a present moment where they're like, oh, I'm not here. It's just experience. Or, you know, they've known suffering in a deep way. There are a lot of people who get perspective because they've known dukkha. And, you know, when you've suffered and, and when other, you know, small things don't bother you as much. I believe that it's time now to start being a little bit more in a collective um, that Buddhist culture in the United States and in Europe can also be about community. I've seen that how that works in, in Buddhist countries and whatever you do, there's gonna be difficult things and, and um, whatever. But I think that this thing of like me doing something to get something, you know, my teacher, Ajahn Sumedho used to talk about it and I, I used to ignore him. I'm like, whatever, you know, I don't know. <laughs> but now I get it. It took me a couple of decades where he really was saying, what, you think you're getting something? Like you're gonna go meditate or study and then, and then you're gonna gain something as opposed to this thing of like letting go and dropping. You know, it is not possible to just say, okay, at, you know, 9.05, I'm going to let go of my anger. I'm just gonna let it go. It really annoys me when, when there's meditations. It's like, let go of whatever you have. I'm like, oh, how do I do that exactly? Just because you told me to let go, I'm gonna do it automatically. Like that's not how it works for me over a lot of people that I know in my life. Let go of your anxiety. Um, okay, <laughs> just, just, I'm just gonna put the switch. Like, okay, I have a switch here. The anxiety is gone. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. But what's funny, you know, there's this very famous saying that if enlightenment is, a, is an accident, meditation makes you accident prone because meditation can soften things. And um, the other thing is, you know, there's 30 meditation techniques in the scriptures and loving kindness got really popular in European based culture countries. But there's these other ones, you know, that when I, I would read these things, like, you know, looking at a disc of different colors. And I don't know many people who, who teach the casinos, but when I look at a Rothko painting, I experience what they're talking about. Um, there is a painting at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, and it's just a red square. And I was just, you know, communing with it. And then my friend Jared comes and laughs at me next to me. He's like laughing at me because I'm staring at this. And I'm like, I'm having a moment here, you know, I'm, I'm communing with this Rothko painting. But there are things that you can do that calm your mind. And if people, I've, I've known people who say, I don't know how to meditate because I can't quiet my mind. I'm like, well, you don't have to quiet your mind. You know, there are meditations. My other teacher, Ajahn V, has this lovely meditation where he just sits, if it's 30 minutes or one hour, and he goes with the names of everybody he knows, wishing them well. So he'll take his maternal relatives, it would be like, may Cindy be well, and then he goes through the, the teachers he had from when he was a baby to now. And it's this thing where he's actually speaking in his mind and he's very restful. And so that's something where I also find that the more you meditate, the more chances you have that your meditation will find you. I've had this experience now a number of times where you know, I was having a lot of energy and then all of a sudden my hands would go into these mudras. And now you can go into a shop and get mudra cards. But you know, sometimes I would open my, I would open my, my eyes and my, my hands would be like, whoa, you know, how did that happen? Um, 
one time I did a meditation of light where this you know, light was coming out and I only did it once, but it was very powerful. So I wanna encourage you to keep on meditating because um, you know, Ajahn Sumedho, my teacher found the sound of silence where he would hear this kind of sound and Hindus have been doing that for centuries, but it just happened. So these things are really common that when you meditate, you know, when I, when I meditate, I kind of look at, like if you're at, at the sun and you're looking at the sun and then you close your eyes, there's kind of that light. I, I'll close my eyes and I'll, I'll just focus on the, the lights, you know, and it's very relaxing. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty cool. Um, are there any questions on meditation or anything else, by the way, or um, on how to use scriptures or any other technologies? Just want to open it up again, and then because I can keep on talking. This is not difficult for me. Um, but want to see if if someone wants uh, to chime in with something that is coming up for you, or you have a question. I do have a question, but I don't want to hog things. <laughs> so you can tell me not to. <laughs> um, it's a question about the we're doing the precepts um, in the Buddhist study class and the one on sexuality. Um, it was really interesting for me because, well, there was an article that Mark sent and I can't remember who wrote it. I think she's a Buddhist nun. And at the end of the article, she was saying that there's sources that have whatever in coming down to what the Buddha taught um, that he was um, sexist. Uh, now, I don't, I apologize, I don't think she were, used the word sexist. So if anyone here knows exactly how she phrased it, that'd be great. My interpretation was that there was some um, uh, not viewing females as equal. Um, and then I was just thinking how every religion seems to have that theme and just um, so when sexuality came up, Mark was talking about desire and how these emotions and all of this, you know, attraction can come up and desire. And I, my perspective is almost the exact opposite as a woman. And as that, I think it's hard pressed to find a woman that hasn't either been raped or almost raped or has um, been um, has had uh, uh, has been sexually harassed or all of the above and then now with women not having the right to their own bodies that sexuality is almost the opposite of aversion and like disgust and so it just felt different hearing that you know I mean Mark's a, a male um straight male and that it's it seems as though there's this talk about all this energy of sexuality and desire and not about the um aversion apprehension and fear because of um how women are are treated so yeah Thank that's it for, um when i hear you talk i i'm i'm hearing about three streams there's a stream of the patriarchy and sexism there's desire and then there's a lot of stuff on sexuality and the um the political ramifications, the personal ramifications. So, you know, there's a lot, right, in sexuality. And so with the desire part, you know, sex and food are very powerful. 
when you have sex, right, you're tasting, you're listening to things, you're using your eyes, so, you know, you're touching, and then you have your mind involved. And with food as well, right, you hear the crunch, and you have, you know, so you have to sign it. And in the milieu of the Buddha, right, in India, where you have religion saying to women, oh, you have to pray so you can become a man in your next lifetime, so you can be enlightened. You know, you're living in a world where a woman had to be protected by her father, then by her husband, and then a brother or a son, because a woman couldn't be by herself. You're in a milieu where women couldn't be monastics. You know, the men could use all these spiritual technologies, but women were not allowed. And so you have this thing where in India, women, if you have a, a female body, you have a lesser birth. It's just, that's the way it is. And the Buddha comes in and allows women to be nuns. Ananda, his cousin and attendant, had to ask him three times to allow women to become monastics. So if what's on the scripture is true, you know, it's been 2000 years, there's a lot of translations, but we know very much, I mean, it's very clear what the state of women was. Um, but then the bhikkhuni order comes in very powerful. And now in 2022, women monastics are having a hard time. You know, I was on the board. I don't know if you know Aya Ananda Bodhi and Aya Santa Chita. I just left the board of directors of their monastery. And just witnessing the sexism and patriarchal stuff that they have to deal with in 2022. And so, you know, sexuality is something that we could talk for a really, really, really long time. Um, it's very powerful. And when it comes to spirituality, you know, like, again, why is celibacy something that is presented? And Osho, you know, this controversial guru from India that I was actually part of a research project I did when I was an undergrad. But he said something that struck me quite strongly. And he said, you know, if we think of sexuality as this lump of coal, and you're walking around with this coal, and then all of a sudden it turns into a diamond because you've, you've healed your sexual past, you're transforming your sexual energy and now you have this diamond and you're walking around with it and other people look at it and then they look at their piece of coal and then they throw it away. <laughs> he was talking about how celibacy or sexuality or anything else that you have, that if you get rid of it, I'm gonna push away my sexual desire. That's not how you get a diamond, you know? And uh, you know, we live in a world now where um, there is progress, right? Like there's not just two genders in some parts of the world, and even legally, uh, so I'm in Germany where you can have in your passport, you're, you don't have to be male or female. So things are changing, but the politics, you know, the, um, the oppression of women in so many countries, if you think of 30,000 years of humans running around cultivating stuff, what was happening 5,000 years ago? You go to Mia, the Minneapolis Institute of Art, and there's this little Venus figure that I love to visit. She's 20,000 years old. You know, and I look at this and I'm like, hmm. Or the Virgin Mother. Just recently, last year, I was thinking, ah, oh, virginity. Women have this superpower to create life in a way that a man cannot. And yet in Europe, a century ago, they would say, oh, you know, all the power comes from, from the male. And women are just kind of incubators. They actually would write this, and this was science. And you know, if if the baby looks like the mom is because the blood got infected, the blood, you know, cunning. And I was like, really? 
But then I was thinking of the Virgin Mother and at the San Francisco Museum, I love museums, of Asian art, there was a, a statue of Isis. And Isis was the Virgin Mother, right? And she, she's holding Horus like this, the way the Madonna holds Jesus. And I was like, huh. So here's this woman who can be a mother and she doesn't need a man. <laughs> you know, it's not virginity. Like all of a sudden virginity becomes this twisted, weird thing, like really weird and horrible, you know? But I'm like, huh, the virgin goddess is this woman who gives birth and she needs no man. <laughs> like I've been thinking about that, you know, how, who knows what was being uh, done, you know, and, and how women were treated 10,000 years ago. And it goes in cycles, but, but the last 3,000 have been pretty intense for women in a lot of places where the cruelty and the, the oppression has been so intense. And, um, you know, a question of how, how do you deal with being part of an oppressed group? So when I'm in Minnesota, I'm a person of color. Here in El Salvador, nobody knows what a person of color is. Like that term doesn't exist. I'm just kind of here, you know, I'm Salvador. Oh, people ask me where I'm from, where I go, which is kind of annoying, but. <laughs> Except in Cairo, they didn't ask me there. They just spoke Arabic to me. So apparently I look like I'm from Cairo. <laughs> so, um, there was a lot in what you said, and I appreciate what you said. And um, I think that with whatever our lot is, with the understanding of karma, uh, I also have, it has been very useful for me to know that in the scriptures it says, if you try to figure out the workings of karma, you will go crazy. You know, it's not, it's not possible to figure that out. You know, like, why does this happen? What, you know, um, so as people, we have the karma to age, you know? What happens when you're very attractive in that particular culture or you're not? What happens when you don't fit in this binary and you live in a country where it's not acceptable? to get out of that gender box. How do, we, how do we take that and then work towards our happiness? And those are such important lives. And to be honest, some people don't have the privilege to think about those things. And sometimes also think like keeping the precepts can be a huge privilege. They have placed 40,000 people in jail in El Salvador because they're gang affiliated, according to the current government. And some of these people are 16, some of them are 30, and they've been stealing and killing since they were babies. <laughs> and so when I look at the precepts, and, and I do this as a guided meditation, is that last week, did I have the privilege of not having to kill someone? I didn't have to defend anybody. I was raised by parents who were not killing in front of me. Did I have the privilege to not have to steal? I have more than what I need. So I don't have to go and steal. And that feels like this beautiful gift. And I've worked on my happiness. Like there's a saying like, Calladito me veo más bonito. I look prettier when I'm quiet. Because my aunts, my mom's sisters, have this habit of repeating what they hear and then adding their stuff, and they create conflict all the time. I'm like, come on, you're in your late 70s and you're still gossiping and hurting each other. Like, how long is it? Like, and I actually told my aunt this, like, I don't know, you're getting up there and you're still doing this. But you know, to look at this and to say, I look at my sexual energy 
and I'm trying to heal and, and, and be respectful. And what a gift that is. And to have the precepts as something that is super valuable. So again, with my teacher, we, you know, we would be on these long retreats and everybody's kind of grumpy. He was like, did you keep the precepts yesterday? That's good enough. You don't have to be this sophisticated meditator or spiritual person. And the wisdom part, the panya part, to start noticing how do I suffer and then to not, I want to get rid of it or I want to you know, push that push and pull, but I'm like, I notice I'm like this. And then you start noticing and once in a while, like I remember, you know, I grew up with silent treatment being the way that you punish people. And I didn't know that I was like this until, you know, maybe eight years ago, I was giving a silent treatment to my husband and I just crossed the street and I was like, I'm not going to do this anymore. Like it wasn't a decision, like just this drop, it just dropped. Like, I will not do silent treatment anymore. I will use my words. But it just kind of came, you know? And, and things like that can happen when you, when you become curious, when you um, spend the energy, the time, and it's, and it's this gentleness. And it's also this, um, you know, in Buddhism, there's, there's the word chanda, or uh, there are words where you push yourself, you know? or you polish the mirror, because when you start doing spiritual practice, it's going to be tough. Karma ripens. And that's when those technologies, that's the toolbox. You know, my toolbox is filled with stuff. You know, there was a little earthquake at one in the morning here. You know, the, our, the, the name of El Salvador before the Spanish came was the Valley of the Hammocks. We we're right in the ring of fire. So there's always that, all of reality is always shaking. And so, you know, at the earthquake, I'm like, ah, and then I'm like, okay, this happened, you know, and I have tools um, to do that. And I'm so grateful to have them. So I don't know if I addressed everything that you're talking about, probably to them, because it, it can be very painful. And, you know, when you, when you notice the state of the, you know, 1979, the United Nations declared it the year of the woman. And uh, I just memorized it because it struck me so strongly when the UN said, women are about half of the world's population and they do two thirds of the world's work and they earn one-tenth of the world's income, and they own one-hundredth of the world's land. I was like, wow. In a lot of places that hasn't changed. And to have the compassion, right? To have the wisdom to, to go on knowing that that's the planet that we're living in. And I finish a lot of my talks in my group by saying, just remember that whenever you work towards your happiness, you are honoring everybody that has ever loved you. And you're healing your ancestors and you're honoring your ancestors. Because the people who love you want you to be happy. <laughs> it's, it's that simple. The people who truly care about you, they want you to be happy. So when you spend time being kind to yourself and, and developing yourself, that's a gift also for the new generations. And they're like, oh, that person is happy. That's possible. So then you give hope to the young ones. So it's really important to, um, to do that. Huh. So with that, we we'll talk about generosity and I don't know when it was that I've made something clicked when I was like, you know, 
in a way, the beginning of spirituality is generosity and it goes into a circle where the end of spirituality is generosity. Now, I'm not saying this, but I, I want you to give me a tip, you know, like, oh, he gave a Dharma talk, let's give him some money. I, you know, <laughs> not into that. But uh, I think generosity is it's a really interesting thing because how do you know when you're being truly generous to yourself, you know? Like, you know, like splurging, like, oh, and now I'm gonna buy myself something. Is that what it means to be generous? It's an interesting question, right? So again, in your toolbox, what, what does it mean to be generous to, to yourself and then towards the world? And sometimes it's like, you know, like here we're in a semi-desert and in Melbourne, just think about water. They have these four minute timers. So you take a shower in four minutes and that's a way of just handling the fact that there's no water. And you think of Minnesota, oh, okay, there's 11,000 lakes, there's just water. But, you know, sometimes just being content and not hogging stuff, is, it's, it's a way of being generous. Just, you know, the thinking about that. And, and, and also gratitude is a way of practicing generosity because you notice what has been received. So my monk's name was Katanyuto, which means one who feels gratitude. And the definition of Katanyu is you notice, you pay attention what has been received. And when you actually take the time to see what you have and what you have received, many times the feeling comes up. So that gratitude is not something that you think about, but it's something that is experienced. And I have seen people cry because they feel so grateful. Like something that, you know, they receive something and they just get so touched. And, uh, and it's such a, such a beautiful way to live, you know, when you, you have gratitude. So all of these things, all of these tools, um, not as something to, again, add to your spiritual resume or to become puffed up about, but I just live the moment. And the other thing is, you know, with, with spiritual teachers and stuff, like I can say really pretty things, but you don't see me when I close my door. You don't know what I'm thinking. Like, you know, people, he, people are humans. And so people, you know, you can have now, I have seen people that are being meditation teachers and marketing themselves and having a persona. I was in, in New York in Times Square and it was this beautiful person looking to the side, um, advertising their meditation stuff. And I'm like, huh, how interesting. So maybe in my lifetime, there will be, you know, meditation mega churches where you go to that Viking stadium and somebody will charge a lot of money to give Dharma talks. I don't know, maybe I'll see that in my lifetime. I certainly didn't think I would see what I'm seeing now where, you know, mindfulness has become such a, such a big word. Anyway, um, that's the way I give talks, you know, they're all over the place and, and it's, it's all good. And, and uh, I just think that suffering and the end of suffering, um, <laughs> Lady Gaga will lead the chance. That's a nice, that's a nice girl. She probably will. She's talked to the Dalai Lama. <laughs> you know, we suffer. And uh, the third noble truth is that there's an end of it. And if you just think of it at the present moment, the, the natural state of the mind is peaceful. The fact that we live in a society that doesn't have that, doesn't, that you don't have to be a good meditator. You don't have to be a great scholar. You don't have to be you know, a superhero charity worker but with humility, with patience. Once in a while, you, you get a moment of grace, you get a, a, a gift, which is to experience the mind, but just the way it is. So, ah, thank you for being here. Uh, I look forward to uh, 
uh, being in Minnesota, again, the retreat at Prairie Farm is from the 22nd and Gabe will be assisting me. I think there's um, 12 spots in rooms, five in tents, and then 15 spots online. So it's Thursday evening to Sunday afternoon. And I think I'm giving a Dharma talk at Common Ground in some evening or I don't know, it's scheduled, so.